On the phone, it is a um, uh, pleasure to uh, welcome to the uh, the program uh, senior editor at Fusion.com, Felix Salmon. Uh, Fusion dot is... Net. Uh, dot net. I'm sorry. Dot I apologize. net. We, 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 we've moved beyond dot com, Sam. We're now dot net. <laughs> dot com Do is so 2004. You guys have totally... <laughs> Uh, Dude, you're like you're like 1998. It's actually seriously. Uh, <laughs> actually, it's sad, but that is that is actually true. I would probably put me closer to 93. I'm just hearing about it from friends. Um, <laughs> so, all right. So, Fusion uh, was one of two uh, American outlets that engaged in this. Uh, I wouldn't call it crowdsourcing journalistic sourcing I, how uh, tell us the process on how this uh document dump or leak was uh combed over so it was all done through the auspices of this amazing non international nonprofit called ICIJ the International Committee of Investigative Journalism and what they did was they wound up putting together a consortium of about 400 journalists from countries all over the world, um, often not the biggest organ news organizations in each country, but the most collaborative. And we all basically just came together to pour over 11.5 million documents that we had managed to obtain from this law firm in Panama, Mossack Fonseca. And... Between us, we found a whole bunch of stories, and you know we, we've seen a lot of them already, and there, were, there are more to come. But there's just an astonishing it's, – it's so hard to do this kind of work and so time-consuming. It's taken a year already, and it's not even close to being over yet. All right. I, I, I'm going to circle back to sort of some of these uh, meta questions and, and discussion of uh, the process, because I know there was you know, a sort of a – I guess an encrypted Facebook or a sharing site that was developed, and then I want to ask about, um, you know, the uh, what the potential sources of this could have been, uh, and what the implications are of that. But the, it seems to me, and 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 correct me if I'm wrong, and and I'd like you to expand on this. But there seems to be basically three primary reasons why one would use these services. One is money laundering, the other is tax evasion, and the other is evading international sanctions. Um, is that is that sort of a, a, a broadly speaking, um, a the, the, the categories of, of stories that we're looking at here? And uh, just to expand on, on those uh, three areas, if, if you could. So yes, all three of those things are going on. Um, it's important to note that those are probably the three top illegal reasons why you'd want to use these services. There are perfectly legal reasons why you might want to use these services as well, and it's probably fair to assume that most of what Mossack Fonseca is doing is actually legal, um, which doesn't mean it's not scandalous. You know, as in so many of these things, often the scandal isn't what's illegal, the scandal is what's legal. Um, but in general, you know, I think you can more or less just take it up a whole other level of um, broadness from what you were talking about and say the reason why you create these companies is to hide your identity, you know, from whomever, from the people doing the international sanctions, from the tax authorities, from, you know, the person you're getting divorced from, you know, you're trying to hide assets, from whoever it is, if you, you know, if you're... You know, it doesn't matter whether you're Vladimir Putin or if you're just some, you know, book author in the United States. If you don't want people to know um, where your assets are or, you know, things like that, then you can sort of hide them offshore in these shell companies. OK, so uh, so give us a sense of the process. And let's I don't know. Let's start with the uh, prime minister of Iceland. Uh, he seems to be a rather... <laughs> Uh, 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 I, I still don't know whether he's resigned or not. It's a little bit unclear. He seems to have just sort of taken a sabbatical uh, of sorts. Uh, in some, <laughs> like sort of just stepped away. I'm going to take some, yeah. some paid vacation uh, for a couple of days, a couple of personal days. But, I mean, what did, what, did he, uh, what did he do? And where did he get this money? And what, just uh, use this as a sort of an, an illustration of what... Um, what someone might do uh, if one was the prime minister of Iceland and you wanted to do what he did. 
So again, like there's, you know, insofar, I don't think he did anything illegal. I mean, I think he failed to disclose some highly pertinent information, which um, the, you know, electorate of Iceland felt, certainly felt that it should have been told. Um, basically that he owned a bunch of bonds from the big Icelandic banks, which he was in charge of restructuring. So this is important information. He had a conflict, and he didn't tell anyone about the conflict, and he put the bonds in an offshore shell company where no one knew about them. And that is you know, what you might say an almost archetypal example of the lack of transparency. The point of these shell companies is to provide opacity for people who want opacity. And the principles of Mossack Fonseca have come out and said, you know, this is an attack on privacy. And in a little way it is, you know, that what we're saying, what the people of Iceland are saying is that, no, you don't get to secretly own a bunch of bank bonds and not tell us. We, you know, deserve to know that information. And it's not cool if you um, hide those bonds offshore, even if, you know, you paid all of the tax you were meant to pay, and even if everything you did was perfectly legal. I mean, it does seem to me, particularly in that case, too, that, right, you you would have a, um, that that's not just an appearance of a conflict of interest. Like there, <laughs> That is a conflict of interest. <laughs> yes, like, this is not just a question, this is not one of those situations where the, uh, the cover-up is uh, worse than the non-crime per se. It seems to me that if he sort of announced like, hey, incidentally, uh, I'm also going to um, uh, invest in these banks, essentially, um, and knowing where they're going to end up on the end or other end of this process, uh, it seems to me that I would, uh, you know, were I an Icelandic citizen, I'd be a little bit upset about that. And it seems like half of Iceland did, like, you know, turn out in the main square of Reykjavik to demonstrate and cause his resignation, which then he seems to have changed his mind about whether he resigned or not. Um, but yeah, it's like I, I, Iceland as a country is scandalized by this to the point at which the new prime minister, if there ever does get a new prime minister as a result of this, might well be the head of the pirate party, this, you know, kind of ultra anarchist party, which is very Icelandic and just says anyone can do anything. Because... Um, because it does, it does erode your faith in the rule of law and in the idea that your representatives are representing you rather than just their own interests. We're getting a little ahead of, uh, of, of, of where I want to go, but we, we, we can circle back. But that was one of the things I wanted to ask you about this sort of broadly speaking, because um, we, we have yet to see really a lot of American involvement in this. And, and, and I want to uh, talk about why that may be the case uh, in a minute. But uh, so I think it's harder for us here in the States to get a sense of what the implications are of this, not just, you know, on the career of for the prime minister of Iceland or, you know, the, the, the president of Ukraine uh, or, um, uh, you know, uh, Putin, <laughs> Um, which I have a feeling it probably won't, you know, affect his political trajectory too much. Um, but, 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 but in terms of just the mood of, of the, uh, of the people of these countries who are going to be impacted or, you know, and, um, I mean, presumably, right. I mean, in Germany it may not be high government officials, but just the sense that there is, um, there, you know, that that the I don't know, the one percent, but the, broadly speaking, the sense that like there's there's a, just a tremendous amount of unfairness and you know, corruption in some way going on. Is the, do you is that a thing in in these countries right now? I mean, is to, to ask the question is to answer it. Of course. Yeah. I mean, people around the world are up in arms about the shenanigans of the one percent and what you find and you're absolutely right that you find this more in other countries than you do in the united states is the is the international what you might call the internationalization or the offshoreization of, of the wealth of the one percent you find and this has been going on in europe for as long as i can remember that you know people have set up accounts and 
the Channel Islands or in Luxembourg or something like that. And then it moves to the British Virgin Islands and it moves to the Cayman Islands. And often people move there because in every country except for the United States, if you leave a country, you no longer need to pay tax in that country. Um, American citizens are almost unique in being taxed on their global income wherever they live, anywhere in the world. So for Americans, it's, it's slightly different. And America has its own tax shelters in places right. like Nevada and Delaware. Uh-huh. So the need to go offshore is lower in the United States because, again, the scandal isn't what's illegal. The scandal is what's legal. The scandal is that you can protect assets right here domestically in the United States and pay no tax on them. And remember also that the United States, being the global hegemon, has much less sort of political risk that your um, assets are going to be seized by the government or confiscated. You don't need to protect them from the government or hide them from the government necessarily because there's less chance that the government is going to turn around and, and just confiscate everything you own because, you know, it's Ukraine. Is it is it also possible that uh, Maseko Fonseca the is it possible that there's an Americ there's a I guess a more of American friendly firm? In other words, I mean, are these the only guys doing this type of thing um, in terms of a law firm, or are there other firms in uh, maybe in Panama or maybe somewhere else that just sort of get more referrals from uh, American corporations. Or- Absolutely. So, so the, referrals, the, the referrals that we're seeing to Mossack Fonseca are coming overwhelmingly from places like Luxembourg and the Channel Islands. And Luxembourg and the Channel Islands tend to be, you know, the places where the European rich bank, right? So where do the American rich bank? I don't know, Miami or, you know, the, you know or it's, it's, we don't know and... Of course, like there's a million law firms, there's a million private wealth managers, there's a, there's a million, like, there's a whole world of very shadowy professionals who exist to try and optimize people's taxes and make sure that, you know, create companies and structures which make sure that people's wealth can remain confidential. And, you know, if it's confidential, then maybe, hey, you know, we can get away with not paying taxes on it. But... I, you know, I don't want to speculate too much about whether and to what degree Americans are doing the kind of things that we're seeing um, other people do in these documents. But I can tell you that there are Americans in these documents and that, you know, you, we, we haven't seen all of the Americans in the documents. There's, there's more news yet to come out. Okay, so that's a. I mean, um, obviously, the you you have certain, I guess, uh, parameters from confidentiality uh, aspect. But are there are there to the extent that this is broken through in this country as a story? Are are there names in there that you think are going to, um, you know, end up on the uh, the the nightly news? Let's put it that way. I, I, I don't really want to speculate about that. Okay. Um, I do think that what the, you know, the very big story here, rather than trying to drill down into individual scandals about individual people who are keeping money offshore, and remember that, again, you know, it's not what's illegal, it's what's legal. I mean, right. we saw this. We saw this when we looked at, um, Mitt Romney's tax returns, right? And all of his crazy offshore vehicles that he had. And it was all legal. And he was doing a great job of, you know, shielding a whole bunch of assets and taxes. And he had, the, you know, the world's largest 401k. And everyone was like, how do you get a 401k with, you know, tens of millions of dollars? And it my 401k, I can only max out at like $7,000 a year. Um, so it's, there's a bunch of stuff which, I guess all I would say is just look at Mitt Romney, you know, right. that was news when Mitt Romney was running for president. But if he wasn't running for president, would it have been news? I don't know. Hmm. All right. So uh, will you cough twice if it's Trump that you're talking? I'm joking. Um, so well, but but what about uh, I mean, give us a, a couple of a, a, a sense of, of the stories that you have reported on or that uh, you, your your folks at, at Fusion have reported on? What are the ones that 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 y- are you f- uh, you found to be most surprising or disturbing? 
Sam, I'm, I'm a very cynical journalist, <laughs> and and it's hard it's hard to surprise me or shock me. You know, I mean, you know, you discover that Lionel Messi has a bunch of offshore companies to deal with his endorsement deals, or that Vladimir Putin might not actually be getting by on a civil servant salary, and you know, and and I'm not necessarily going to be massively shocked by right. that. And um, you know, I. Again, for the purposes of, of stories and journalism, you want to write stories about the kind of people that people have heard of, you know, the celebrities and politicians and that kind of stuff. And the fact that celebrities, you know, politicians and celebrities might have a bunch of money that they want to hide offshore. Again, it's not nef- it's not that shocking right. to me. Um, you know, the, the sheer size of the network the fact that you have like one poor woman in panama who's apparently a corporate officer of 20,000 different companies um the you know the just enormousness the, the hundreds of thousands of shell companies that mossack fonseca has set up over the years of uh, years of various banks and individuals and you know that was like whoa this is huge no one i had no idea just how big this was even you know as you say this is just one more firm in panama this is it's not like these guys had some kind of monopoly on this business so what so what happens like people at uh, they're at a i don't know they're at uh, davos and they, they all you know they're, they're, they run into somebody at a coffee shop and they're just like where where do you keep your uh, money that you're trying to hide from your future ex-wife or uh, when you're, you know, when you guys are trying to sell weapons to North Korea, where do you, where do you, where do you do your shell company business? I mean, is that basically what happens? That's an incredibly good question. So the, um, historically, uh, the, the nexus was, and then when I say historic, you know, it, it was with Swiss banks, basically, you know, and, and that, kin. So you'd go to UBS or Credit Suisse and you'd have your private banker and then they would know the tricks of the trade and they would be um, hooked in with Mossack Fonseca and they would know how to do these things. And then private banking has moved you know, internationally. It's not all in Switzerland anymore and it's not necessarily the biggest Swiss banks anymore. Um, but we do see a lot of HSBC in newspapers. Um, there are other ways in, you know, there's a lot of what's known as family offices and there's a lot of very, very secret um, meetings of people who work for family offices. And, you know, family office is a euphemism for basically, you know, the people whose entire job is to just manage the money of people who are incredibly rich. And they go to meetings in, in expensive hotels and they quietly talk about tax optimization strategies or something and they'll learn about the services offered by Mossack Fonseca and people like them. And yeah, there's a whole network which is not public and you know, you, you can't just like wander into these things if you're a journalist or if you're not in charge of a few hundred million dollars. But they happen all the time. And uh, so, I mean, do we have any sense or let me put let me put it this way. Do you guys have any sense or does um, the the German newspaper um, that received the first uh, or I guess the 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 dump or the leak? Do they have any sense of 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 who's behind it? Not as far as I know. Um, it was all done over encrypted communication with someone who was very careful not to reveal their identity. Um, and so it's unclear to me at least whether this person ever works with Mossack Fonseca, whether it was just someone who managed to hack the client website of Mossack Fonseca, which apparently had a bunch of um, weaknesses. But you know, I don't know how the information was obtained. and. Frankly, it doesn't really matter. You know, the, the important thing is, is that we have now not only obtained the information, but we've spent a lot of time and done a lot of effort in sort of going through it and trying to find stories. And as I say, those stories are not over yet. How did, uh, how did the, the consortium uh, determine when this stuff was going to go out? I mean, did they say, like, you've guys, uh, everybody's got a year 
we're going to put this out within a year? Or was it um, the journalists sort of all voted and said, uh, we've got what we feel like we need at this point? Or, or how, did, how did that determination happen? That, that was determined by, centrally by the ICIJ, and they were in touch with all of the news organizations around the world, and they wanted to make sure that we all had enough time to have a bunch of really good stories um, you know, on Sunday, and that they wanted all of these stories, you know, a, a whole bunch of stories to appear on Sunday, on, on, on like day one. Um, not all of the stories that people are working on have been finished. So as I say, you will see more and more stories coming out in the days and weeks ahead. Um, and, you know, the question of like who was going to set the day and time for like that initial big push of like all these stories appearing around the world, that was the ICIJ basically making the determination after talking to all of the news organizations that at that point, more or less everyone should be able to publish a big story at least. And um, and uh, do, do you have a sense of like, you know, what this means for the future? I mean, I, I guess part of it is, and I don't know if we'll ever know, you know, who leaked this. I mean, right. I mean, the, the it, it, I've heard some speculation that it was the U S government uh, as a way of, you know, uh, perhaps embarrassing certain, um, you know, people who are named in these uh, documents seems to me it could also be rival law firm, right? I mean, like, uh, I mean, if I was uh, one of these people's clients, I'd be right now, I'd be looking for a different law firm uh, because they can't keep my stuff secret, it seems like. Um, do, what does this mean going forward? Uh, I mean, is it uh, is this stuff going to be actionable in, in specific countries? Is it um, uh, is it going to have implications for for more of these documents? I, I mean, I presume we're going to see more of these, it, right? It's, it's going, well, we may or may not, but the, I think the, the first big effect that it's had, and it's happening already, is that the KYC laws, the know your customer laws in banking have been tightened up significantly already just in reaction to this uh, leak. And the banks, if they do any business in the U.S., which means every bank in the world pretty much, um, aren't allowed to just say, oh, this money belongs to XYZ company in the British Virgin Islands. They have to know who the beneficial owner of that company is. And that's an important um, change. Wow. So so they have to, it, it's, I mean, it, does that mean there's no more shell companies? I mean, it, no, if, I know. I mean, the shell companies are there, but, but the bank, if you're dealing with a bank, and obviously, if you're dealing with money, then you're going to be dealing with a bank. You can't really transfer money without going through a bank in one way or another. Um, and then, if you're going through a bank and the mon and money is sloshing in and out of Cayman Island companies, then the law now says basically that the bank needs to know not only the name of the company, but also the beneficial owner of the company. So they can see through essentially these shells. That's the idea, yes. And so, that's, and, that, and that's known as KYC. And KYC has been around for a long time. Um, but what we've seen in recent years is that KYC has been beefed up and it's getting stronger and stronger. And the more, you know, it's a little bit of a game of cat and mouse, you know, that people like, you know, there was a bunch of lawyers out there who are going to do their best to try and get around even the new beefed up KYC laws. This industry is not going to shrivel up and die overnight. Right. But I think, you know, as I say, one of the reasons why um, we haven't seen a huge number of Americans in this league so far is, is the, the kind of banking secrecy, which has been quite common in places like Switzerland or Luxembourg or the Channel Islands has never really been the case in the U.S. And so, and so, um, this uh, the the beefed up uh, KYC uh, rules. This will allow essentially governments doing investigations to track this stuff, right? I mean, that's there's not going to have any implications. It's not like this stuff is going to go in the newspapers, and uh, it's just that going forward. There's going to be more access to this, so that's that's going to help in 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 the illegal stuff, right? Right. So there's you know I mean there's a bunch of different things. There's KYC, which is know your, know your customer. There's AML, which is anti money laundering. There's 
ATF, which is anti-terrorist finance. And yeah, all of those things are designed so that banks, by law, have to tell regulators, have to tell the authorities if they see anything suspicious. Interesting. Uh, Felix Salmon, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, you, people can read more at fusion.net. Dot That's the one. Net. All right. Thanks Dot so much, net. Felix. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, I'm Sam Cedar, and this is an Ann Coulter doll. You should not be immigrating here. No. Stay in your country and hate us. For smart progressive talk and a little bit of this and even a little bit of that. Mission accomplished. Subscribe to our podcast, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and like us on Facebook to get some of our best video clips.